There we go. Good evening, everybody. It's Owen Sound City Council on August 12th, 2019. Uh, we're starting off at 7 p.m. We did not have a closed session, so we're moving right into the open session. Number four in our agenda, I'm asking for any additional business. Does anyone? Council Merton? Yes, I'd like to speak to the Community Foundation Gray Bruce 25th Anniversary Celebration details. Okay, anyone else that way? Councilor Greg? Thanks. I uh, would like to speak to the CMHA Food Forest Labyrinth opening. Good. What's that way? Anyone this way? Deputy Mayor O'Leary. Thank you, Worship. I have three items tonight. Best of First Friday, Grey Bruce Kennel and Obedience Club's Dog Show, and the Under-19 Canadian Basketball Tournament. Uh, anyone else that way? Uh, maybe just speak to one. That's the Emancipation Festival that was... Disclosure of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. Anyone? Deputy Mayor O'Leary. Thank you, Worship. I have a pecuniary interest in item 8A, as I have uh, interest in another restaurant. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none. Confirmation of council minutes. Councilor Merton, look up the list. Moved by myself, seconded by Councilor Hamley, that the minutes of the regular council meeting held on July 15th. 2019 has printed be adopted. All in favor? That is carried. 16. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Hamley, that the minutes of the special council meeting held on July 15, 2019 has printed be adopted. All in favor? That is carried. 16. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Hamley, that the minutes of the special council meeting held on July 26, 2019, as printed, be adopted. All in favor? And that is carried down to number seven. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Hamley, that City Council now move into Committee of the Whole to consider public meetings, deputations and presentations, public question period, matters arising from correspondence, reports of city staff, consent agenda, committee minutes, matters postponed, motions for which notice was previously given, and additional business. Thank you. All in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. That uh, it gets us into committee of the whole. We do have a public meeting tonight. Um, I will first of all declare the public meeting open. Every person who attends a statutory public meeting required under the Planning Act shall be given an opportunity to make representations in respect to the proposed bylaw. All submission materials for this application are available on the City's website and at the Planning Division um, here at City Hall during the regular business hours. If a person or public body would otherwise have an ability to appeal the decision of the City of Owen Sound to the local planning appeal tribunal, but the person or public body does not make oral submissions at the public meeting or make written submissions to the City of Owen Sound before the zoning bylaw amendment is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting, or make uh, written submissions to the City of Owen Sound before the zoning bylaw amendment is passed, the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of uh, an appeal before the local planning tribunal, appeal tribunal, unless in the opinion of the tribunal there are reasonable grounds to do so. Go ahead. Do you, Your Worship? Notice of this public meeting was circulated to the prescribed bodies, posted on the city's website, and published in the Sun-Times on July 19th. The comments that have been received were included in the agenda package. For those of you who missed signing the sign-in sheet on your way in, it is located on the table just inside the door. The personal information collected at this public meeting is collected under the authority of the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act and the Planning Act. The information collected will be used to complete the zoning bylaw amendment process and will form part of the public record. Questions about this collection should be addressed to myself, the city clerk. 
And if you wish to be notified of the decision of the Corporation of the City of Owen Sound on the proposed zoning bylaw amendment, you must make a written request to the City of Owen Sound, care of the City Clerk. Great, thank you. We'll first hear from uh, our planner, Ms. Tan. Welcome. Get you to uh, push, the, push the little purple button. There we go. Now we can Got hear it. you. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening, members of council, staff, and members of the public. We are here this evening to hold a public meeting to gain public input, input for zoning bylaw amendment number 29 for phase two of the Heritage Row development. The lands are on the easterly limit of the city and currently contain a number of retail stores, including Michael's, Winners, Home Sense, Princess Auto, Value Village, Dollar Tree, and Pet Value. The subject lands are addressed municipally as 2151 16th Street East. The lands are size 7.6 hectares and contain retail stores as noted. The lands do have frontage on 16th Street East and on 20th Avenue East as well. Here you'll see an illustration of the surrounding land uses in the area. The surround loose, surround, surrounding land uses include Home Depot to the west, the hospital to the southwest, the rail trail to the east, and the city's industrial park to the north. As you can see from the illustration here, the proposed development area is located to the north of the subject lands. The area proposed for development does front on 16th Street East. And the vacant portion of land to the south of the built-up area, as you can see on the, on the aerial there, is not proposed, to develop, proposed for development under the subject application. So in the Owen Sound uh, official plan, 2006, the subject lands are designated East City Commercial and are located within the Sydenham Heights planning area. This designation permits large format retail and service commercial uses, which requires significant on-site parking requirements. This designation also accommodates single or multi-purpose sites. In the City of Owen Sound zoning bylaw, the lands are zoned C2 or retail commercial and are impacted by special provision 1489. That underlying C2 zone provision does permit hotels, gas bars, restaurants, and retail uses. Special provision 1489 specifically refines the uses and the gross floor area for each use that is permitted on site. So here we have a, an illustration of the proposed site plan. The city has received a complete application for a zoning bylaw amendment and site plan approval. The two applications are being processed concurrently. The subject lands were partially developed in 2012, 2013, uh, and the subject applica applications represent the near build out of the site. Here's just a bit of a zoom in of the development area, the new development area. And for interest sake, this is submission two for the proposal. So the proposed zoning bylaw amendment, the purpose is to permit a commercial development on the remaining vacant lands in the Heritage Grove development. The effect of the proposed amendment is as follows. To add permitted uses on the site, specifically being a hotel and a gas bar, and to modify the site-specific zone regulations to permit the development of the site. So we do outline a bit of a list there of the proposed development, being, of course, the four-story, 75-room hotel, the gas bar, which includes four fuel pump stations, a convenience store, and a quick-service restaurant with a drive through and six restaurants and three detached buildings, all having outdoor patios. So you may see from the second submission this uh, this portion of the site plan is amended slightly, that does not impact the intent or the purpose of the zoning bylaw amendment. That's a matter of site plan approval, as those uses are already permitted on site. So to further note the effect here, uh, the proposal also includes the construction of a shared surface parking area, 
internal road system, landscaping, and the construction of a stop controlled access at the future 22nd Avenue East and 16th Street East intersection. As noted, a complete application has been received by the city. As part of that complete application, we've received a number of studies and plans, uh, planning justification report and urban design analysis, draft zoning bylaw text, traffic impact and parking study, functional servicing report and site servicing plan, stormwater management plan and sediment and erosion control reports and plans, a market retail analysis and site and landscaping plans and elevations. So of note on this list uh, includes the market retail analysis, which was triggered by the rezoning within that East City commercial designation as specifically required by the city's official plan. Uh, this, re this review is triggered more specifically by the request to include additional permitted uses in that, uh, special, that special provision zone uh, and additional gross floor area above the caps uh, that are specified in that 1489 special provision. So um, this is a very, very specific uh, special provision pertaining to these lands, which uh, is essentially laid out like a pie. And that pie is divvied up into uh, different permitted uses and the amount of gross floor area that is permitted to be allocated to each of those uses. So this is a pretty particular work we're undertaking here with this amendment. The purpose of that uh, peer, that rather that market retail analysis, uh, is to review and assess the impact of the of the proposed uses and the, those increased gross floor areas on the city's downtown core. As part of that review process, uh, because we don't have personnel uh, at the city of Owen Sound, we do have that market analysis peer reviewed by an outside body. So the process so far, for your interest, a complete application was uh, received on May 8th. A letter of completeness was provided to the applicant on May 24th. A notice of complete application was provided to prescribed persons uh, and public bodies and, and to the public on June 7th. A technical report was provided to council on June 15th. Uh, Accessibility Advisory Committee considered the proposal on June 24th. First submission comments were provided to the applicant on June 26th, and a notice of public meeting for tonight's meeting was provided on August 12th, per the requirements of the Planning Act. So the process from here includes final re review and consideration of public comment, uh, which has been garnered prior to this evening and will hopefully uh, be added to at comments received tonight. Uh, so. We will be reviewing those final comments and provide those that feedback to the applicant as well as um, feedback from city staff. Uh, necessary revisions will be made from that feedback. Um, and then hereafter, a recommendation report will be provided to council. Uh, we, were, we were anticipating August 26th. Uh, revisions that we've received to date may cause that to be a little bit later. They were. Um, received just recently. So um, as noted, this is a very complex uh, zoning category on the subject land. So we're all taking care to uh, make sure it's correct and, and considers the uses properly. And as noted, the zoning bylaw amendment and site plan approval are considered, will be considered by council concurrently so that everything marches through the process as it should. So uh, from here, I'm more than happy to entertain comments or questions if you have any. Mr. Kepke. Thank you. Through you, Your Worship, uh, to the planner. And the, if someone could flip back to the map of the subject land, at one of the early ones at the very beginning. On the north, yes, the north side of the property, there's an irregular shape. Um, can you explain why that is and if the city already owns the irregular shape on the other side? Through you, Your Worship. Um, I can't answer that specifically. I do anticipate that the irregular shape has been caused by uh, road widenings that have been taken by uh, the city slash MTO. This is in the connecting link area of our jurisdiction with MTO. Um, if development is not proceeded on the other side through uh, a Planning Act application, those road widenings may not yet have been taken if they're required at all. 
Okay, it was just confusing because all the other drawings were squared off and this was in a regular shape, so I didn't know if, you're, if those road widenings were needed or if there's more needed or what. Thanks. Amy, didn't we deal with those a couple of weeks ago? And I can't remember. We did a trade on some of them, yeah. Do you know that? That was maybe just through the clerk's department. Um, granted, did that change the shape from what we're seeing? Yes, I believe it is squared off. We um, had an agreement with the uh, landowner. <coughs> Thank you. Other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. So the next part, we look for uh, present, uh, sorry, comments from the public. If there's any member of the uh, public, we'll ask you to uh, step up, state your name, where you're from, and, uh, and proceed. Go ahead. And again, there's a little purple button. Oh, you found it. Perfect. Thank you. Good evening, Your Worship and Council Members. I'm Laura Lee Spencer from Spencer Planning Services. I'm here on representation of the property owner directly to, to the north, which is 759-501 Ontario Limited. Uh, we have submitted a letter, which I believe was in your agenda package, and our concern is with the additional development that's permitted on the property at this point in time, or being contemplated, I should state. Um, at this moment in time, there is C2 zoning on the property directly north, which would permit all of these uses. Um, our, my client, I should say, has an interest in the property in addition to the individual asking for these exceptions at this point in time, still has an interest in the property at this moment in time. So our question, I guess, to council to consider is that there are additional C2 uses. And in the letter provided to council, uh, at that moment in time, as part of your agenda, was that we have five existing gas stations in proximity to the subject lands, in addition to a number of hotels. Um, I'm not questioning the restaurant services because I think it's six restaurant services, in my professional opinion, is, is a, a, actually um, in excess of what could be serviced at this point in time, and I'm not quite sure who was here at that point in time when the, the exception to 14.89 was made, but I will say that it, it's putting the other existing restaurants in jeopardy by permitting six more restaurants to be in existence and, and in support of the city of Owen Sound and existing restaurant uses. If you look at the vacancy rates downtown at this point in time, I do believe that there are ability to accommodate specific specialty type restaurant uses and that needs to be considered, considering there's a significant number of vacancy rates downtown, and you can, you can walk by and, and visualize it. The second component would be that we haven't seen the peer review of the market impact research that has been done at this point in time, and I understand that MHBC is undertaking that. In absence of that, I would say that this application is premature. It's uh, not acceptable to consider that this should be something that moves toward a public meeting for the purposes of a zoning bylaw amendment, considering there's C2, C2 zone lands directly across the street that aren't being developed. So I would ask that the increase, increase in commercial space should, space should not be permitted. Um, there was a specific reason why there was zoning restrictions put in place on the site to begin with, and again, Going back to who was on council at the time, I think you need to remember that this is a property that has had conflict in the past, and there were certain reasons why those restrictions were put in place. It's not that they can't develop the property without a zoning bylaw amendment, because they absolutely can, but asking for more at this point in time, I would say, is premature. Um, there are saying at this point that there is a notably younger demographic moving into the area, which I would state is based on census data. Um, understanding that, I would also state that there's a number of subdivisions in place, and I will acknowledge that I am involved in a couple of them, that that is not incorrect. However, they're still not approved and the plan of subdivision has not been approved by council. It's an anticipated 
anticipated increase in census data that isn't there yet. So I would say at this point that this application needs to be deferred until a later time. I would say significantly as well, you have to look at the Heritage Place Mall and their vacancy rates, um, of which I don't have a specific number at this point in time, but I will tell you that anyone walking through there will understand that there is significant vacancy rates in the mall, and I can't anticipate that that's going to change in the near future. Again, goes back to the application being premature. So on behalf of my clients, I would say when there's already C2 zone lands directly across the road, north of the subject lands, that this application is, is definitely stepping ahead and deemed premature, as far, in my professional opinion. Good. Thank you. Questions? Councilor Hamming? Thank you. Just a point of clarification. The only letter, and perhaps I missed it, that I've seen is from John, I don't know how to pronounce the name, Gulen? Gulen, yes. Are you representing him? Yes, I am. Okay. Yes. This is a numbered company, but yes, he is. He's the gentleman, and my letter is included in his correspondence as part of your agenda package. I, I guess just this question of clarification again, because I'm not going to engage. I quite agree with you that we need more information. But the letter I've read from Mr. Gulen seems um, seems full of conclusions and so forth it, it, and argumentative. And I'm not saying that in a negative sense. I would welcome something with more background and more reasoned consideration for counsel. So I don't know if that – go ahead. So in response to your worship, uh, I absolutely understand that there is a position, a personal position on that component, but my letter is included in there as a professional opinion. And I believe it's on the screen right now, this, your letter. Yes, it is. Yeah. In front of us. Good. Thank you. Others? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public that uh, wishes to speak or comment? Right. I'm seeing none. No one's moving quickly. No one's moving slowly. No one's moving towards the microphone at all. So I think with that, we can declare the, uh, oh, yep, go ahead. i get you to push the little purple button there so the, then we can hear you. Good. Go ahead again. Thank you. Uh, my name is Robert Russell. I'm the planning consultant on behalf of the, uh, the property owner, the developer. Uh, sorry, I didn't get up earlier, but I didn't uh, understand you were asked for the public rather than the proponent. Uh, my apologies. Um, anyway, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the committee. Uh, as I stated, my name is Robert Russell. I'm with Robert Russell Planning Consultants. Uh, we, I am the, the planner who's been hired to represent the developer and provide the, uh, the planning review for this uh, proposal at this time. I'll be relatively brief. Uh, we just have a few key points we want to reiterate and, and to get across. Um, and I'll also be happy at the end to answer any questions if there are any. Um, the purpose of this application is really just to ensure that existing uses that are permitted in the C2 zone are still permitted on this. There was some discussion with, uh, with town staff earlier, or city staff earlier on, that they may or may not actually be uh, permitted, uh, and we may not have needed a, a zoning bylaw amendment to proceed. Uh, but it was decided that uh, we probably should go through with the zoning bylaw amendment to allow the hotel and the gas bar uses. Um, so we're not asking for anything new, but we're just asking for these uses that were at once permitted to be reinstated on the site. Um, these uses just were not in the realm of consideration when uh, Special Policy 1489 was approved, and there was there was no need to. Did, the developer didn't feel that there was a need to include them at that time, so they weren't requested. Um, and those uses that were included in 1489 are basically based on just the uh, the the list of retail uses under the uh, the, the national standards. Since this uh, the site plan that you see on your screen is the site plan that we just provided last week. It has some amendments, has some revisions based on the original submission, uh, and those revision, those uh, amendments haven't actually been reflected in staff comments yet. Uh, so it, one of the key things is we have reduced the amount of restaurants. We are no longer provo uh, proposing for six restaurant pads. We're down to four restaurants now, um, and the total cumulative uh, GF, and the issue with the restaurants is not the total amount of restaurant space is the amount of restaurant space of small restaurants. So Special Provision 1489 says there's a minimum restaurant size of 325 square meters. 
But we are allowed to have some restaurants smaller than that, as long as in aggregate they don't uh, exceed 464 square meters, which we did, and we still do. But that's all it is, is the small restaurant component of it that is at issue with this bylaw. Restaurants are permitted. The total GFA of restaurants we have is permitted. It's just the number of smaller restaurants. Um, right now, we're down to four restaurants, three of which would be smaller, and those three added together uh, come to... We're now at uh, 6,800 square feet. Uh, so we're, we're a little bit above the 464. However, if you consider the gas bar, the quick service restaurant that's included in the gas bar, if you exclude that from it, we actually are underneath that cap of 464. Uh, the, the market study and the, the market experts uh, suggest that the gas bar market, or the quick service restaurant and the gas bar, serves a totally different market. Uh, so it likely can, uh, it would not, would not be fair to equivalent or, or, or equal that to the other quick service restaurants. Um, we've also agreed since the time of this original application that the, uh, the restaurants will be phased in. Uh, this is a discussion we have with town staff in an effort to bring in the restaurants as development on the site and the hotel and other uh, developments around start generating the market demand for these restaurants. These uh, zoning ballot amendments are directly related to tenant requests. These aren't speculative. These are, there are tenants who are ready to sign leases for most of these uses, and we just need approvals for them to do so. Uh, they're looking, these tenants are tenants or businesses that want to locate in Owen Sound, but they haven't found another site that's suitable for them. I can't speculate to why they've made those business decisions, why they couldn't locate in another spot, but this is the site they've chosen. Um, and we're just looking to, again, implement those uses that are already permitted, or were permitted. Um, when special uh, provision 1489 was approved, it was a different retail market then. The retail market is continually evolving, it's continually changing, and what applied then may not be valid anymore. Uh, so we have updated the market study. The, obviously, the, uh, the tenants themselves are the ones who have the best idea of what the market wants because that's the business they're in. And they want to be here, and they, want, they think they can support their businesses based on this site plan. The proposed hotel is uh, proposed to be an upscale boutique hotel. Its location at the Eastern Gateway will provide a great um, entry feature to the town, to the public as they arrive on, uh, on uh, Highway 26 on 16th Street. Uh, and with the upscale boutique nature of the hotel, certainly the urban design of the building itself and of the grounds will certainly lend itself to that, uh, that higher degree of aesthetic uh, that would be required at a gateway. The market study has also demonstrated that proposed uses are uses that could not be located downtown. It, we're not taking away a, from any other downtown landlord who these uses might want to locate in. These uses, again, as the East City commercial areas, these are uses that need large sites. There are no large sites downtown for a 75 unit hotel for sites that require all this parking. So they'll appeal to a different, they provide a different product and they'll appeal to, appeal to a different market than the people who shop downtown. In summary, I, all the supporting documents that the city has requested were provided with their application, and we're working through some revisions on them based on the comments we've received to date, and we will endeavor to continue to have that dialogue with the city, uh, and we'll certainly take all comments from staff and from the public into account as we uh, finalize the, the application. Um, I also wanted to uh, reiterate, uh, as the Planner had previously said that the application is in full conformity with the provincial policy, state, provincial policy statement with the official plan, and it generally conforms to the zoning bylaw as well. Um, again, we welcome any input, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that I can. Sorry, I didn't have my microphone on just uh, to re-record that. I thank everyone that did come in. I declared the um, public meeting closed and thank everyone that had uh, input. Thank you.
Uh, number nine, I've got a deputation from Mr. Kafalis, but I see his chair is empty over there. Ms. Coulter, you're filling Mr. Kafalis' shoes. I am. We just have a few images we're going to put on the screen for council. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm pleased to provide this brief update on the uh, progress of the downtown river precinct construction. So the project is progressing well. Um, last Friday, the, uh, the contractor did ask for an extension till mid-September, and uh, staff will be negotiating that timeline with the developer. So at the north end, at 9th Street, the shade sails have been installed and the, uh, the decorative rocks have been placed. Um, closer to the farmer's market, you may have seen them removing the steps today. The contractor or their subcontractor, Piccoli, is back on site finishing um, the concrete work, um, including the Percy England parquet extension. The bike pad was poured today as well as some um, curb, sidewalk, and asphalt is about 90% complete now. Um, at the farmer's market, you can see that the roof um, structure is starting to go on. The trusses should be up by the end of the week. Um, the electrical work in the precinct area is about now 50% complete. So just a reminder for anyone who's looking for information on the DRP, um, the city's website has information and the Digging with Dennis videos are linked there. So if you're looking for more information, go to the website. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Coulter? Uh, Mr. Councillor Thomas. I guess my only question would be knowing that uh, all of our various developments and projects are balanced on a knife's edge this year, uh, what sort of an impact uh, an extension to mid-September is going to have on the 10th Street Bridge project? Um, through you, Your Worship, certainly that's something that uh, Mr. Kefalis was away last week. Uh, certainly Mr. Paquette indicated that that would be an important consideration as they talked to the, to the contractor. Um, it may well be, though, that the road um, with the asphalt would be able to be open, sort of normal traffic, and that these are um, finishing things in the area of landscaping. But uh, again, coordination with the 8th Street Bridge closure, as well as then uh, working with the other contractor uh, on 10th Street will be important. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, public question period. Is there a member of the public that wishes to ask a question? Come on up, Harold. Okay. It's been a long time being on TV. I'm not to do something for the city. Okay, you just state your um, name. Harold Pritter from the Kamaz Department in Owen Sound. Um, a long time ago, I started a recycle program many years ago downtown at Tim Hortons on 9th Street East many years ago. So I was a genius to discover everything was going on black bag. I said, what? I said, there's recycling on the cups, lids. The cups are recyclable. You only use one bag for the waste of stuff for food. So that's how that got discovered many years ago. Um, um, every time I go biking, I always find um, very fine nails, three inch spikes. Now this is very common with carpenters and house builders and drywallers. They're not putting their nails inside their trucks. For some reason, if a wind comes by, it's gonna blow those nails and put them on the road. And most drivers can't see those. There was one time I stopped at 10th Street on top of the hill, where the light is where it goes to the back center. There was a nail big enough to do a tire smack in the middle of an intersection. Over to one side, get off my bike, gave her a little bit of cargo bike, picked up that nail that was lying on the road. Now there was fine glass over by 8th Street East. 
on a small intersection. So I was on the one side all this time. I never picked up. So bicyclists, um, sometimes don't realize that at nighttime, they don't see that glass. And they'll have a tire flat on their bike sometimes. So that's why I discussed for today. Okay. For the first time live on TV. Good. So you're just, <laughs> just bringing attention to the fact that there's an L's and things along the curve. Yeah, there should be a truck with a magnet of some kind uh, to go through the town somehow and pick up these pine nails so the drivers don't have something that they don't see driving. So, Mr. Ritchie, do you know uh, how often the street sweeper goes around uh, this time of the year? Uh, thank you, Worship. It certainly does a route of the entire city annually, so at least once a year it gets on every street. We do the downtown core. I've been, been informed more often than that. Ms. Bolter saying four mm -hmm. once a week. So over the course of time, every street does get done. I can tell the public our street sweeper was out of commission for a while this year, so we are a little behind, but we will get to them all eventually. Mm -hmm. Good. Especially very fine glass, so like some some people throw beer balls and not accidentally but break and fell on the road. And you don't see that glass. So thank you very much, Harold. Very welcome. Um, number eleven on our agenda. Correspondence received for which direction of council is required. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Body, at its meeting on July 10th, 2019, the Owen Sound Downtown Improvement Area Board of Management passed a resolution requesting council support for the development of a downtown action and marketing plan, as presented within the letter to council. The request is for $15,000 in funding. Costs will be split equally between the OSDIA and the City of Owen Sound for the development of this plan. A draft RFP has been prepared and will be presented to the OSDIA at its meeting on August 15th, 2019. I'd be happy to answer any questions, Council Mayor. Questions? So uh, we need a motion that, oh, there it is right in front of us. So the motion would be that in consideration of correspondence dated August 12, 2019, from the Owen Sound DIA Area Board of Management, OSDIA Board, respecting downtown action and marketing plan procurement, City Council approves allocation of up to 15000 from Rural Economic Development Grant Fund Reserves, Reserve Singular to the OSDIA Board of uh, Downtown Action and Marketing Plan Initiative. I understand because we're moving money out of one department to another that we'll need two-thirds vote. And um, this will allow the um, marketing plan to get going for the uh, DIA. Does so someone want to move that? Councillor Thomas? Actually, I just have a point of clarification on item number three in the uh, motion. <coughs> Pardon me, which reads, request that City Council consider partnering, which is not an action. I think what it's requesting us to do is partner with them, not to consider partnering. Yeah, I gotcha. I'll get you to look at the... Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. It, it uh, is not asking us to actually, it's asking us to think about it, but it's not asking us to do it. And I think what they actually intended was that we do partner with them. It would be the motion that I think is on the screen in front of you. Have you got it? Sorry, I was reading the other motion that yeah, yeah, in the yeah, resolution of the DIA. Does someone want to move the motion that's on the screen in front of us? Councillor Greg? Well, I'm not willing to move the motion. There's, Councillor Thomas has brought up a, a point here which I did question myself. Just how we had the original, or how the DIA had that original resolution that was to consider, and then as a council tonight, we were provided the motion to spend the money. Personally, I think this is premature. It's something that I would support doing at budget time. I think that would be a more appropriate time for us to consider it. I might be in support of it. I might not. When I look at it now, and I've taken a look at uh, well, that Brooks study I looked at a couple years ago. I looked at Kamloops, uh, London, Ontario. Uh, there's a plethora of in-depth studies, and they all come to very similar outcomes. We have we we know what our issues are downtown. 
public washroom. Your Worship, a point of order. Sorry, sorry, uh, Councillor. A point of order. I'm just confused. Are we debating a motion that's before us now? Or no, what the doing? motion is not before us. So, so shouldn't it be before us before we debate it? Technically, yeah. Councillor Thomas. I will move the recommendation. I was simply questioning the wording in the DIA's uh, original uh, uh, paper, but uh, I'll certainly move the recommendation. Good, good point, uh, Councillor Tamer. Thank you. Um, so it is now on the floor. So uh, if you wish to continue, Councillor Drake. Thanks, for everybody. Another one that I've got on my screen here is smartgrowthamerica.org. Uh, so there's great studies out there. And they all come to very similar pillars. Um, and their public washrooms is a necessity and parking accessibility and people with the dollars to spend and the density of people, public spaces, synchronized hours of retail and, and restaurants, signage, clean and safe, removed panhandling, grocery carts, etc. We have some of these initiatives that we've, we're trying to implement right now. The public space, um, we've got the parking uh, trial for a couple of years right now, which I would remind or, or mention that the taxpayers are assuming a small portion of that. Um, there's components to this that I think we're already trying, and I think just to spend that $30,000 at this time gets us to an outcome where largely we already know the information that's out in front of us. I know Councillor Tammy, last, uh, last fall you were speaking about, you had your own idea about um, an individual to be in charge of an initiative to clean up downtown or recharge the downtown. I think to spend or allocate the money here removes the opportunity to to evaluate your idea. Whether I like it or don't like it, I don't think you get you get a chance to speak to it fairly. So to, for me to approve or support this tonight, I can't. I think it's, it's early. Um, I would support, uh, I mean, in fact, this was done in consideration of the presentation at the DIA meeting from, from Mr. Fisher. Council didn't even get the presentation, so I don't know how we could approve spending budget on something that we didn't even see. Uh, so I, tonight I'm not in support of it. Any other comments? Deputy Mayor O'Leary. Thank you, Worship. Just to correct Councilor Greg, we're not spending 30000 we're spending fifteen. And uh, uh, just to simplify it, this is by far in the best interest of the city, and that's really where I'm looking. So I'll be supporting the motion. Others? Uh, just a question through your worship for staff. Have we had before a targeted, comprehensive, intelligent review of the downtown and how to market and brand the downtown? Has that happened in the past? Through your worship, um, I, I guess in short, I would say no. In 2017, uh, we engaged a, a partnership between the city, the DIA, and OMAFRA. And we did a study called the Downtown Revitalization Study, and it really looked at who were our clients and what were the strengths and weaknesses of the downtown, where did people come from, and what were some of the gaps in the downtown. So um, the, the draft RFP really does ask the consultant to look at that background information, look at the city's strategic plan, look at our official plan. But um, really it's, it's summed up in the, those 20 ingredients that Roger Brooks speaks about. And as Councillor Greg notes, we have many of those. Some of them are check marks for us and we're making progress on others. But what the DIA, and they've been talking about it since March at their meetings, and then they'd ask for a report back in June about how to make this happen is really a rebranding and then a detailed marketing to-do list. And I would say, certainly not in my time have they um, prepared this type of plan. Go ahead. So, I guess the, my comments that fall when I read this with interest, and I agree on some level it seems premature and, and there's not enough detail that I personally like to see. So I understand what you're saying, Councillor Gray. The downtown is, is um, has some green shoots but I think we'd all agree it's still suffering. If we have not had a comprehensive review of branding our downtown, personally I'm in favor of this motion, but Councillor Gregan, all candor, and I watch dollars as closely as you do, I think 15K is just gonna be the beginning of what's necessary to retain a quarterback, use whatever term you want, to focus people on what can be done and what cannot be done. I'll just give you one example. 
In the report of Brooks, he says, grab one or two of your downtown blocks. Make that a, uh, make that a test case in what you're going to do. That kind of work is going to take much more than a consultant just coming up here and floating the idea. It's going to take, I personally think, a paid staff member at some point with expertise and proven expertise in this area and other towns to go in and try to find that test area and get it done. So this is going to be a lot of effort, a lot of time, and frankly, a lot of money. With Councillor Leary, 15K, it, it, I'm not saying it's insignificant, but it's the least we can do right now to lead to the kind of decisions that we're going to have to deal with in the future. Those are my comments. I'm going to go to uh, Mr. Ritchie first. Thank you, Your Worship. Certainly, in, in my time with the city, we have done uh, various observations of the downtown, and we've come back with studies that we have put quite a bit of staff time and some dollars into. And we have always struggled to have partners that want to work with us to make the core a better spot. I can tell you in the last 24 to 36 months, we have a partner in the DIA. Both partners have been working very hard to improve the downtown core. I was at the DIA meetings where they discussed this. The DIA had a thorough discussion of it. Is it time? And I think the consensus of that board was, if not now, when? So is it perfect timing? I think generally we'd all like to wait till perhaps some of, our, some of our downtown construction was completed, but I think that board felt they maybe don't have that time. Yes, we've, we've certainly, uh, Ms. Coulter and I have, have listened to several, if not four or five, of Roger Brooks' seminars. They're fantastic. But he has a number of ideas, I'll call them uh, bullets, do this, do that. We go, wouldn't that be wonderful? I think for the DIA, again, partnering with us, and perhaps others we can focus on. We can't do everything. We don't have the staff, the financial resources to do everything. This will allow us to bring someone in, perhaps collectively give us the best bang for the buck, focus on that, get some improvements, move ahead, and then perhaps expand on it in ways we can't even imagine at this time. But is timing perfect? Absolutely it isn't. But I think the DIA board and their members feel it, it has to be now. They can't wait. That, that's really what I have to say. Thank you. Councillor Hamley? Just so we're clear, um, this $15,000 is coming from a reserve from a grant that we received for this kind of plan? That, that is correct. It's a rural economic development grant that we uh, received some time ago. We didn't spend it all. We've been holding it in reserve, and this will allow us to quite frankly just draw from that reserve for this occasion. Thank you. Councilor Thomas? I think it's important to be mindful of the fact the DIA has gone through a major transformation in the past year, and it is not the same DIA it was. Uh, it has put its faith in the city, and it is working more closely with the city than it ever has been before. And I see this as a, as a small token of what we can do to uh, help build our downtown, which is something all of us want to do. Thank you, Councilman Merton. Through your worship. I believe that the scope um, is actually bigger than an action and marketing plan. My understanding is that it really is a visionary and also a vision preparation strategic planning as well. So it, it's more than just marketing from my conversations and the drilling down <coughs> excuse me, into the information. And I think we need to recognize that to develop things, you have to have a vision and you have to have a plan. And then the marketing initiatives come out of that. By bringing people together in that visioning, you actually have people start from a common goal and move together forward. So an opportunity to work together for the future exists. My question is, who actually owns this marketing initiative? You know, the word, and I know we talked about co-partnering. It's sort of co-paying at the moment if we move our, our 15,000 over. Who actually owns this? By contributing, do we then assume that we partner on an ongoing basis with the recommendations and any other financial implications that may come out of this study? So I'd like to know what the city's obligation or implied obligation will be as a result of should we decide to move forward? Mr. Richard? Good questions. 
And, and to be honest with you, I don't have the uh, technical answer at this time, but I will tell you how it has gone so far working with the DIA members and below. When we look at issues, we find solutions. We work together to find those. Who will own it? We'll all own it. Who will? They, they as, as much as the city, have limited funds, and we're going to try to maximize working together to get the most out of those funds, but you're right, with a vision. You'll hear me reporting later tonight on the strategic plan review. It's a vision. Uh, we were very clear with our consultant at that time. We didn't want a pie-in-the-sky strategic plan that had a vision. We wanted objectives. We wanted goals to reach those objectives so that we could hard and fast say, if we do this, hopefully that will happen when we reach the vision. Within that, it left us room as staff and as council to say, there's more than just that. And, and I'll say at times we, for lack of better terms, we freestyle to say, that's not one of the goals there, but that's going to reach that objective. That's the type of thing I see with this eventually. It will give us a vision, objectives to reach that vision, goals to reach those objectives for all of us, and the DI members and board to say, within that, we might have to freestyle along the way to get that objective. How do we do that? How do we pay for it? So I don't have the exact technical answer, but that's how I see it working. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kepke. Thank you, Your Worship. I just want to add that I do think the timing is right for this particular initiative right now. The momentum is there between the DIA and the city. Um, there's lots of people on the DIA board that are really keen and gung-ho to get things moving, as well as retailers and business owners in the downtown. So I really do think that the timing is right on this one. Okay. Well, seeing none other, I'm going to call the question. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six. Opposed? One. So that carries. Thank you, Mr. Robert. Uh, section 12 uh, of, our, of our agenda. 12A, report from the city manager with regard to the uh, annual review of the City of Owen Sound's 2015 strategic plan. Thank you, Worship. I've probably already stolen some of my own thunder, but the subject tonight is annual review of the City of Owen Sound 2015 strategic plan 2020, making our vision clear. The City of Owen Sound strategic plan embodies the long-term vision and goals of Owen Sound residents and provides a strategy for the future development of the city. The plan's vision is own sound, where you want to live. The mission statement defines how we will accomplish the vision. The mission statement is strengthening our community through sound leadership. The plan has four pillars that provide a clear direction of where we are, where we want to be, and how we will get there. The pillars are economy, society and culture, finances, and environment. Each pillar is important to the community. The plan has 15 objectives that support the four pillars. Each objective has a series of actions that specify how the city will contribute to achieving the objective and overall vision. There are 41 identified actions. This report is available to the public on the city website, so I will not review objective by objective and action by action the progress made in 2018. I can say that significant progress was made on many of the objectives, and Council and the community can take pride in that. In some areas, we wish the progress was quicker or greater, but in several areas, almost all of the actions that, that were set have been accomplished. City staff refer, the, refer to their strategic plan regularly, and the current plan has served the city very well. Many of the components and much of the background information for the 2000s 15 strategic plan are still relevant today. The vision, mission statement, and core values may require some fine-tuning, but the overall aspirations of the community remain much as they were in 2015. What may have changed are the objectives and the actions to reach the overall vision that the community has for the next five years. Council will complete the first year of its four-year term in December. With an understanding of the citizens' wishes still fresh in your minds from the election last fall, and now a full year's oversight of the operations of the city, early in 2020 would be an ideal time to refresh the strategic plan. And with that, Your Worship, the recommendation is City Council accepts the report and asks staff for a report on updating the city's strategic plan in 2020. Make a motion. Councillor Dodd. 
Thank you, Worship. I do hope that the, the public does take a look at some of those uh, those statistics that are within that report because there are many good news stories out of that. Um, there are some things, obviously, that we didn't uh, hit, which obviously I think is a good plan for our next, uh, next well, four years of how we can do to improve on some of those areas. I think one of the most important parts here is we talked about vacancy rates uh, previously, and uh, latest reports is 10% in, in, of vacancy uh, in our downtown floor, right? 10%. So and I think that's uh, quite exciting to see uh, with the downtown revitalization plan, with the new uh, developments that we are seeing in the BIA, and not only that, but just the, the businesses and the uh, just the, the, the entrepreneurs that are taking a chance and they're doing something unique. They're doing a niche market, and we're watching the success of some uh, some great places. So I think that's probably one of the most uh, biggest statistics that would um, really put a smile on my face. Anyway, so I'll move uh, the recommendation within that report. Thank you. Good. Other comments, Councillor Greg? I just note one uh, line here. I, objective one, I have retain high that a couple years ago we were doing a, a few tours of some of the the employers in Owen Sound. Uh, we did McLean Engineering, we did Tenneco, uh, we had bad news from Tenneco as a result, but I still think that um, the most important customers you have are the ones you already uh, have. Uh, we spend a lot of money trying to uh, reach out and, and get new ones and, and it's very hard to bear fruit. I'm just wondering Moving forward again, if we could look at, um, you know, firing up that initiative again to get out there and see some of these uh, employers and these catalysts within the community, I think it's a good thing to do. Councillor Dodd? Thank you, Worship. Maybe with that, uh, as the Chair of Economic Development, maybe we could pass along to see maybe in our October meeting we could uh, go to, um, you know, any, anyone, uh, any of our new uh, companies, BWFC or Transcontinental or someone who uh, would be happy to have us. Uh, for that October meeting. Okay, others? I do note some of those local businesses that you've mentioned uh, that have expanded, uh, you know, that retain the uh, Bellwick expansion, the um, McLean's expansion. Um, one other one. Belfour expansion. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, back around the corner from Belfour. Um, McNabb's. Came to town the last couple of years. There's been a whole bunch of. Yeah, uh, Councillor Greg is correct. We probably haven't been out as, as a group to uh, some of our major employers as we have in the past. Part of this plan, and it, and, and it was asked for. Um, I remember when we toured Tenneco several years ago. You may recall, those of you who were there, I asked the plant manager at the time, what can the city do for you? And his, his response was, Really all I'm looking for from the city is to get our taxes. They're in a competitive business. Keep them down. And we, this council and the previous council, we've done that. We've been reduced the industrial tax rates and the commercial tax rates. So, yes, we can get out and visit more. I think they were more interested in give me something I can tell my head office as opposed to, to visit. But we can certainly arrange visits as well. But we wanted goals that were actually going to help them. With that, I'll call the question, which was a recommendation um, moved by Councillor Dodd. All in favor? That is carried. So 12B, Ms. Coulter, I think. Thank you, Worship. In 2017, Council had approved a site plan for a gas bar convenience store and quick serve restaurant at 884 10th Street West. Uh, site plan and servicing agreements were required. Um, subsequently, the property has been sold, and according to our procedural bylaw, the clerk had recommended a report which is administrative in nature but would just allow um, new bylaws to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute uh, amended agreements or new agreements with the new owner. So that's the recommendation, Your Worship. Okay. Councillor Hamley? I'll just move the recommendation, Your Worship. Any other comments? Councillor Gregg? I think it's worth noting that uh, we heard earlier tonight that the east side, some have the concern that there's over-servicing in terms of some establishments. Um, on the west side, I might add this is a development that we're keenly looking forward to. It's been a couple of years getting to this point. It's stalled, and uh, it's exciting to see shovels back in the ground um, because there's a lot of people on the west side who benefit from uh, what really is an under-serviced uh, part of town for this. They have been on the lot uh, working already. Yeah. So with that, uh, call the question. All in favor? That is carried. 
12C, report from our uh, Fire Chief Barfoot with regard to fire protection agreement for Tent Street Bridge closure. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, we're going to start with the, uh, as you said, the Tent Street Bridge closure. Um, as you're all aware, the bridge is going to be closing uh, fairly soon. And um, I have been before Council a couple times. And uh, what we're bringing forward tonight is a plan that we have. It has been to Georgian Bluff Council and it has been to Mead Council and passed by both. And we will be asking uh, Owens Down Council to pass it tonight. So I will go through the operational procedures or the nuts and bolts of what we're planning on doing. So um, our plan is to house one of our pumpers in the inner township fire station. It will be housed there from 8 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock at night, and it will have two of our staff members on that truck. Um, in the event that there is a call to the west side of the city, um, the plan is for our truck and the two staff to go with it, and the inner township staff, if they're in the station, to follow along and assist us if necessary until our truck in the east side station can get across town to get everything set up. Uh, the inner township are going to house one of their pumpers in our station. It will be in our station 24-7. Uh, they will have uh, staff on the east side. If they get a call, we'll respond to our station, get that truck, and then head to the incident. For any calls in, um, I will call it Sydenham or Meaford, and they what we classify as a life-threatening situation, whether it's an MVC structure fire, um, the calls will come in to dispatch as normal. So if somebody's in Sydenham, they will dial 911 and say, I need fire for whatever the incident is. That's such and such a number in Sydenham. Inner township staff will get toned out. If it is a time of day where they feel that they're going to be impacted by the 10th Street Bridge, they will ask dispatch to tone out Owen Sound Fire. We have it set up. Owen Sound Fire will send one pumper, an officer, and two firefighters. We'll leave immediately, go to the call. Uh, do what they can with the staff we have on scene till the inner township staff get on scene can take over and then we will head back to the station unless they need us to stay and we will do that. When our truck leaves, we will be calling in staff, on call staff to come in to keep, keep our level at five for the rest of the evening. So the um, plan here is to work with the inner township to protect both the citizens of Sydenham, Meaford, Georgian Bluffs and Owen Sound to work together towards a common goal. So, um, with the plan we have here, we are anticipating a certain level of uh, disruption from the 10th Street Bridge. I hope I'm accurate. I hope I'm overdone it a little bit. Maybe I haven't. Um, we might have to make changes to this depending on what we're going to find. This is what we're anticipating. We have a plan in place. We will uh, keep on top of it and hope it works. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I could just give you a round of applause. Uh, I think that's probably the most fitting thing for this report because I think it's one of those first steps of looking at how we can uh, work together as our surrounding municipalities while servicing a, a need for everyone. Um, my only question is, um, once some um, firefighters will be stationed at Inner Township from 8 till 6, from 6.01 until 7.59, we'll be, they'll be residing back at the main hall? That is the plan right now, yes. And then if there was a call at that point, Inner Township would be going to that if it was on the west side of the street? What we are there? anticipating after 6 o'clock that the traffic impact won't be that bad that we can't deal with it ourselves. Okay. If we find that this isn't working, then we might have to switch over and have our truck over at the Inner Township Station till 8 o'clock tonight. Okay. Um, again, there's options in the plan. Everybody understands that. Um, we're hoping that it's going to work. We have this plan from Monday to Friday. Um, we'll have to see what happens. Th thank you, Chief. I, I would move that recommendation, and Chief, I, I'm going to give you some credit on all the work you've done to that, and I thank you for what you're doing. I would uh, just like to add one thing here. This is the initial call that we have planned here. Again, so um, anything above this will be classified as mutual aid, which, again, that you understand how that works. This is what we're doing to get a truck on scene as quickly as possible to get the so-called clock stopped and start working on the situation, whatever it is. 
Absolutely. Well, I just think it's, it's great, and uh, it's great to see uh, both uh, Olin Sound Flyer and Inner Township working together um, to service everyone in our, like, in our community with this, the bridge being done. So thank you. Council Merton. Through your worship, um, under the financial budget implications, you've made a general statement about what wages represent. I'm assuming from the information above that you're saying this has no budget implications for us. It, I just need to clarify. It will. And again, uh, so what we did, we went back a couple of years and determined how many incidents they had in Sydenham Township over a year. We took that number and I took it okay. We responded, or they responded so many times, so we're going to anticipate so many calls. Had three individuals called in on overtime for every one, and I believe the number was around the twelve, fifteen thousand dollar mark. So it would be helpful, really, to have that documented, so that as we go through this process, if there's a change from that anticipated benchmark, then we would be able to see that, yes. because as I read this, I'm assuming. And, uh, and that's again, I'm that is going to be very difficult to have a number. We could get into a bad year. So you you are anticipating there would be an increase costing on this proposal? Uh, again, what we're saying here is that um, we're not charging them for our service to them, and they're not charging us for their service to us. Right. Okay? There will be a cost to the taxpayers in Owen Sound to bring in staff for those anticipated calls in Sydney. Mm -hmm. There will be a cost to them, again, which there has been on mutual aid calls, to come in and help us. It would be helpful as we go through this process to have an ongoing information or a halfway through a report sure, on right. the costing for both yep. organizations, sure. yeah. but certainly sure. for, for us. And just, to, just to trend it, just to see what's yeah. happening. But, uh, and again, just for the people at home to understand, I'll go back to the... Um, August 10th fires, I believe, was 2015, where, again, the whole inner township station was here. Um, I understand their bill for labor was well over $10,000, which was assumed by the people of George and Bluffs and Newford. Thank again, you. So we're working together to. Yeah. That's helpful. Thank you. Council so, Captain? Oh, sorry. Uh, no. I, I'm Thank you. Uh, through you, Your Worship. Um, I know this isn't directly your bailiwick, but do you know if uh, ambulance services have a plan in place? We, again, they are part of the team that we've been talking about, and they are planning on putting an ambulance in the inner township station. Too. So the inner township is opening their building to both us and the ambulance to uh, put the building. Deputy Mayor O'Leary. Thank you, Worship. Chief, just in terms of past practice, I, I was thinking if we have we ever done anything like this? I was thinking maybe the, the big dig. Did we, did, you would have been a firefighter then. What did um, we do then? We, uh, again, we put a vehicle on the west side and we sat in the parking lot. It was uh, Ken Stewart's Texaco where the new gas station is being built right now. And we sat in the parking lot from 8 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock at night. We took two trucks and there was two of us and we, we, we sat there for the day. Um, again, there was no... I wouldn't say working relationship, but there was nothing set up for us to go to the inner, inner township station. And this was during the summertime, too. What we're anticipating here is a whole year, so we're going to be through the winter. So we're into a little bit of a different, different circumstance. Here. So back then, you had no facilities? You just used the Texaco That's station? That's why we went to the Texaco station for, for the washroom service. Right. So in this case, our guys will be at the inner township fire department. They'll have access to the, all the facilities. Exactly. Perfect. Great. Okay, thank you. I think back a few years ago, it, um, all the press seemed to be about how we weren't getting along with our neighbors, and uh, we really appreciate uh, certainly the councillors from Meaford and from George and Bluffs working with us and their staff and everybody that it's uh, time and time again we're talking and discussing ideas, and this is one that's uh, coming to up. Anything you want to add before we vote oh, on? I guess my recommendation is that council take this and pass a bylaw along with what Meaford Council and George and Bluff Council have already done. So. And that's been moved by Councilor Dodd. So all in favor? That is carried. Thank you. I think you get to stay at the microphone. Yeah. With your uh, 2018 uh, fire. So through your worship, um, this is the annual 
report for 2018. I will uh, work my way through it, hitting a few of the high spots. Stop me at any time if you have any questions. Um, so I will start again if you go to um, page number four. That is the makeup of the fire department. So uh, in total, we have 26 suppression staff. We have two in fire prevention, a fire prevention officer, a fire prevention inspector. We have a training officer, a deputy chief, and a chief. And uh, we have an administrative assistant that was uh, classified as uh, one quarter day a week. So your, uh, as far as my, my report here, your worship and members of council, I'd like to acknowledge the efforts of all department staff in their, in their duties servicing the, all the citizens of Owen Sound. In uh, 2018, we responded to 809 emergency calls, and this was down slightly from 2017. And again, these responses ranged from service calls, such as replacing batteries and smoke detectors to structure fires and, and tiered medical response calls. And again, these are all broken down later on in the report. In uh, 2018, we had 27 fire calls documented. The total loss uh, for 2000, uh, 2018 was approximately $486,000 compared to $828,000 in 2017. This past year, we, taught, we saw two significant structure fires. One was in a downtown restaurant on 10th Street, and uh, which resulted in a second alarm and a third alarm and a, a mutual aid from the inner township. Uh, the crews were able to contain the fire to the room of origin and uh, yet there was still water and smoke damage to the rest of the building. Uh, this damage loss was estimated at approximately $300,000. The second significant loss fire was a, a kitchen fire in a residence on the east side. And this fire was estimated at an $80,000 loss. Uh, the variance of the number of fires reported to corporate services versus my annual report for you, those that read that, there, they were off by, I, I believe, two. And, um, and again, it was all in the way that they were classified. One was a mutual aid call where we sent our aerial out to help the inner township. And one was a response to a small fire with no injury or loss. Uh, 2018 had us responding to five water rescue calls. This was up slightly from 2017 where we uh, went to four. In two of the incidents in the Inner Harbor, the individuals were out of the water on, uh, when we got there. One incident was a boat that came untied from the dock, and one was a boat that had the engine problems that we uh, had to bring back in, and unfortunately, one incident was a of drowning out in the harbor. In August of 2018, we took delivery of a new pumper truck built by Fort Gary Fire Trucks, Winnipeg, Manitoba. Our 2007 ALF pump truck was traded in. This uh, new vehicle brought our frontline fleet consisting of two pumpers, 100-foot aerial platform, and that was the move that we were, were, were planning on. So our 2004 75-foot aerial is now in a backup role. So as far as frontline trucks now, we're down to one aerial device and, and two, two pumpers. In 2017, as far as personnel change, we uh, brought in uh, firefighter Thede, Brad Thede, who came to us from Sogging Shores, and he's looking after the auto mechanic duties in, in our side. So. Um, and you'll see that the deputy chief made his report. So if you go to uh, page eight, we have the summary of the, of the types of incidents that we went to, and you'll see in 2018 our calls down to 809 from 908 in 2017, and the majority of those showed up in medical calls. Um, for the summary of responses in the uh, underneath, again, it shows you, again, how many how many calls that three of the staff went on, how many four of the staff went on, and how many, how many five of the staff went on. So. Uh, if 
we go to page 9. Again, this here has the second and third alarm stops. So of the 809 calls, 23 of those, they activated a second alarm, and that was bringing in the five on-call firefighters. We had one third alarm and three mutual aid calls. The mutual aid calls was, um, again, us going to help the township and the township coming to help us on separate calls. Uh, if we move on to page 10, you will see the uh, scale here on overtime required for second and third alarms. So this is overtime hours to come in and um, fight actual fires, or what we think are fires. Okay? So with that, so this this here boils down to bringing in off-duty staff. So this, these aren't people scheduled to work. These are extra people coming in. If you look at the uh, scale underneath, this is the scheduled overtime hours to maintain the staffing level at five. So that is to cover for WSIB, for STD, LTD, and, and sickness. Uh, moving on to page 11. This is a breakdown of um, what we've done here is taking all the staff on suppression. We have totaled the hours that we uh, that the city pays for them for the year and broken it down to, of those total of hours, how much time is spent on emergency calls, how much time is spent on training, and then what time's left. You'll see that the time spent on emergency calls is down to 2% from 3% in 2017, and that reflects the 809 calls as compared to 908 calls. Uh, moving on to page 12, um, as we broke down, this is breaking down, again, all of the staff as to the total of number of hours and um, breaking it down to uh, the sick days, LTD days, STD days, and the remaining is the amount of time out of those total number of hours that our staff are able to work. And it's approximately 81%, which is uh, identical to what it was in 2017. So, Doug, if I can just stop you on that one. I got a little confused because it doesn't add up to 100. Uh, 43, 53, 61, 61, 60 almost percent on one side and 81 on the other, and I just... So, and again, um, the one thing that did happen here during the year, we brought in a new program for trying to keep track of this. Okay. And this new program changed what we language we used to speak as days into hours, which we are now putting back into days to try and compare for last year. So, again, it is off a little bit. So. Okay, good. Thank you. We'll, uh, perhaps, Your Worship, if I could, we'll... We'll check the accuracy of that and report back. Thank you. Um, we have numbers here as uh, from the training division. And you'll notice that, again, on the scale we had before, that 7% of their actual time is spent on training. And this has all the training and the different topics that we train on broken down to how much time is uh, spent on, on each thing. So. And the fire prevention staff, they put in there uh, what they've done for the year. And again, that is all broken down to um, some of the th things they've done. They have got into the downtown core to uh, spend time to talk to people. They have looked at uh, what a lot of our calls are and kind of keyed in on that as something to try and get the fires down. And um, if you take a look at our dollar loss, which is not an accurate number, so how busy we were, but again, our dollar loss is down. So, okay. so uh, questions? Questions first. Councillor Tammy. Thank you, Chief. Outstanding report. I've read your reports and your predecessors' reports for years. I enjoy tracking them, and uh, I, I think they're color coded and they're fascinating. Right off the top, congrats to you for getting. Um, sick time and stuff down by almost 20%. I realize that depends on a lot of variables, but I think that's a good trend. Two comments, or, or three comments, including the one I just made about the sick time. By my calculation, uh, or by your own numbers, 
about 1,800 hours are spent by the fire department people actually dealing with calls. That's the total that I read. Does that accord with your memory? Very, very close. Yes. And if I add up all the hours, and if I just cut out the training hours out of that, because and if I just add up 26 firefighters, I give them six weeks vacation. I don't know. If, do they get six weeks? Uh, not weeks. Shifts. No. Okay. In any event, it seems to me that their actual time at calls is around five percent. Does that accord? Excuse me, again, does that accord with your memory? or Actually, 2%. Pardon? 2%. I was high with 5%. Okay. You're very high with 5%. So, you know, as we start talking about hybrid and so forth, as we start moving in that direction, I think it's very important that the city and council keep this in mind, that there are vast amounts of unoccupied time. You can only train people so much. True. Uh, the last comment I'd make is uh, there's 336 medical assistant calls. And I was curious, do we ever track whether the fire department, because I'm sure in many cases they add value, but how do you know of those calls that you've added value? And by that I mean if you come after the paramedic, there's not much to contribute, perhaps. Oh, Is that tracked at all, if you could just speak to that? Are the medical calls that you were, were talking about? Yeah. And again, I do go through that. I, that is taken to corporate services every month. I break it down into, uh, again, the of the calls, how many we, we, we weren't needed, weren't required, canceled, turned back, whatever, how many that we were there for lift assist, and how many that we actually assisted EMS, and how many we did CPR. Okay, so those numbers are all broken down, and they go to corporate services. It used to be every month, it goes every three months. So, again, thank you, Your Worship. So I'm not going to, I'll drop it after this. But of those 336 calls, I'm a little confused because that's what I see in your report. Yep. Of those 336, how much would you say, do you know what percentage value is added? I am very, very close to saying, or I think I'll be very accurate in saying 50% of those were not required. Okay. okay. I thank you. Now, having added to that, no, no. of that 50%, there might be 1% where we assist in CPR and save a life. So we take that. Or, and again, I should add to that, again, I'll go back to some of my own history. The first call that I was on where I assisted in CPR in the back of the ambulance, when I was done, I asked the paramedics, how do you possibly do this without assistance? And his answer to me, not very well. So, again, we go, we help, we do what we can. Some work, some don't, but some do work. Thank you, I appreciate that. I can just follow up on that. Somewhere between 2010 and 2014, I believe, my first term, we changed a little bit um, what medical calls we're going to. And uh, it was uh, if the ambulance isn't in the area and it's in a call further away than we're going, it was after midnight. There were specific times that we were uh, picking up more of the slack instead of going to each and every call like maybe we had previously. Uh, correct. That happened in 2011. If you take a look at the incidents in 2011, we had 1,271 responses we went to. That dropped to 758 in 2012 for that very reason. But what we did there is we took the criteria that we were going to, and I don't want to, um, again, slight this type of call, but we were going to nosebleed. Okay? And I'm exaggerating that, but there was no we're going need to everything. It. We were going to everything, I guess is a better way of putting it. And we weren't needed at that. We downgraded it to the important calls. But what there is is, again, if uh, after midnight, and again, I stand to be corrected on this, there was one ambulance in town after midnight. We were going to more calls after midnight than we were prior because there's only one ambulance on duty. So it was needed. Good. Deputy Mayor O'Leary. Thank you, Worship. I'll move the recommendation. Thanks, Chief. I think we keep the report. Councilor Gray. Thanks, Chief, on the uh, annual report. I just wanted to note, um, and, and also uh, wonderful work on the report before this, but uh, in 2018, we took uh, ownership on a new fire truck. And uh, I know I'd, I'd like to pass along to yourself and the deputy chief and uh, the crew at the fire station as well. I've been down a couple times, and I know uh, a crew uh, gave me a tour of that apparatus um, last year. And there's a... We, we talk about the importance of uh, the equipment and, and our response and ensuring our firefighters are, are safe uh, are 
it's of the utmost importance that their safety is considered. Uh, there's a really neat piece of equipment that came with that fire truck, and it was the reversing fan. Um, so we know in the new home construction now, um, and the accumulation of plastics within houses, uh, the uh, flashover numbers are, are are not what they were uh, 25, 30 years ago. And I know the guys, uh, it, it was very interesting to look at this piece of equipment that they can then uh, put at the residence uh, and then essentially reverse the uh, the fumes uh, and really, I guess, buy time. But I don't know if you want to speak to that or, or just um, some of the apparatus that, that we I, took last year. I believe what you're talking about is a positive pressure fan. And again, that's going back to a new theory on uh, dealing with structure fires. And at one time, we used to put the fans in and blow everything out. And now what we do, we put the fans outside and pressurize the inside of the building. So it's a higher pressure, and now we force the air out where, where we want the smoke and contaminants out. And uh, we're on the move now. We are moving towards everything's battery operated. So now you can take this and carry it up a flight of stairs a lot easier. You don't have to worry about pulling the cord. And they're good for about 45 minutes on a full charge. And usually by 45 minutes, we've got it done. Um, it's just we don't have to have generators on the truck now. And we take it back to the hall, we charge it up, and it's all ready for the next one. So that's uh, what the technology is kind of moving to. So. Good. Thank you. Anything else? No. Call the question then. All in favor of receipt of that report, and that's carried. Thank you very much for uh, the annual report. And everything you and everyone else does uh, down there during the whole year. Uh, we're down to 11E. Ms. Palmer, you're up. Thank you, my buddy. I, I really wish I had gone before the fire department report since purchasing isn't nearly as exciting to anyone except me. Um, as you know, purchasing at the city, we provide direction on purchasing practices and processes. We develop and issue formal bid solicitations. We evaluate bid solicitations. We firmly award and we present recommendations to council for award. We create contracts, prepare, prepare formal contracts and agreements in accordance with the purchasing bylaw. And we also provide consultation and advice and training to city staff related to procurement. Um, you may remember seeing this graphic during the council orientation, but I thought it was important to include it here today. It really provides the framework for everything we do. Public procurement is directed by case law, trade agreements, and legislation, and guided by the principles that you see here. Best value for public money, accountability, openness, fairness, transparency, and adaptability. These principles are key as we understand our current challenges with the processes and tools we utilize and identify changes which will enhance procurement at the city. By having projects with clearly defined actions, communication and engagement strategies, purchasing can ensure these principles remain the focus. So just a little background on being known by trade agreements isn't new for the city. The city's been bound to the Agreement of Internal Trade since 1994 and the Trade and Cooperation Agreement of Quebec and Ontario since 2009. But in 2017, hang on, this is the really exciting part. <laughs> in 2017, the Canadian Free Trade Agreement and the Comprehensive Canadian European Economic Trade Agreement brought new requirements specifically related to public procurement into effect. In 2018, I came on board as the Manager of Purchasing Risk and Asset Management, and through gathering information from supplier debriefings, ongoing discussions with staff, as well as monitoring emerging trends within public procurement practices, it was recognized that this was an opportunity to embrace change. So for that, we've identified four key projects for 2018-2019. I've identified them as building blocks because they really do build upon one another. Although they could be undertaken independent of one another, these projects are connected, and by taking a holistic approach, we can make improvements which will ensure the entire approach to purchasing at the city is efficient and effective. So I'm going to quickly go through the four projects. I'll try not to bore you with the details. Please feel free to wave your hand if I'm starting to get too into the weeds. I love this stuff. The first one is the contract management system. 
So historically, multiple Excel spreadsheets have been utilized for tracking current agreements with vendors, as well as for tracking contractor safety documents, thinking like WSIB, uh, bonding, insurance certificates. And staff manually check for expiring documents and follow up by sending emails and phone vendors. It works, but it's labor intensive. By expanding the existing contract management module that we already have, efficiencies can be gained. For example, the system will automatically notify vendors of contractor documentation when the expiry is upcoming, such as insurance certificates, and amended alert staff if the vendors haven't provided in a timely manner. This ensures that the city will stay in compliance with its duty to ensure we are utilizing contractors with the required documentation, but reduces the labor intensity required. Just to give you a, an idea, we have about 130 contracts currently at any given time. Having the contracts and related documentation in one place enables staff to have better visibility into expiring and renewal options, and that enhances our procurement planning, lets us plan our procurement cycle ahead of time, and lets us think about innovative tools we may want to utilize. The next project is the process review and development of work instructions. So there's a lack of documented work instructions and process maps related to the purchasing process. This creates a lack of knowledge when you have staff turnover, which could delay projects or put projects at risk if steps are missed. It creates duplication of work, and it can cause confusion for our internal business partners, our internal city staff. One of the examples of processes that will be reviewed relates to contract management of construction. There's changes in the Construction Act. Internal processes related to records management and invoice processing will need to be reviewed to ensure compliance that we can meet our requirements in the Construction Act in a timely manner. It provides a great opportunity to ensure that there's documented processes and work instructions available to staff, as well as providing internal education to city staff to increase understanding. So understanding that not everyone is sitting at home on a Friday night reading the Construction Act, it's helpful to have a good overview. The next is the purchasing bylaw review. So the city's current purchasing bylaw was reviewed, updated, and approved in January 2017. And while the purchasing bylaw meets our legislated requirements, some housekeeping updates are needed to enhance clarity for stakeholders, and it offers the opportunity to incorporate best practice. This also lays our groundwork for future procurement projects, like electronic bid submissions, supplier performance evaluation programs, and it gives the city the opportunity to implement some really innovative procurement tools. Electronic bid submissions. So bid solicitation submissions are currently only accepted in paper format. There's multiple paper copies of responses from vendors. For bid opportunities with pages of items for vendors to price manually, we often see arithmetic errors. Um, and then you have to think additionally, once those bid submissions are received, as part of the compliance check of the submission, staff then spend time doing that arithmetic check as well. With electronic bid submissions, vendors are only required to enter unit pricing and validate the system calculated totals. The system also flags the vendor and notifies them if they have missed pricing an item, if they have missed submitting a required document, or if they have missed a mandatory requirement. On the screen is some of the benefits. Um, as well as reducing administration time. The biggest focus of this is that its intent is to reduce having to disqualify vendors for noncompliance. I'm confident that the collaborative approach plan while undertaking these projects enables, will enable the city to continue ensuring that procurement is conducted in an effective, objective, fair, transparent, accountable, and efficient manner while enabling innovative approaches to the acquisition of goods and services. So really the report in front of you is to understand the four projects that we're undertaking and to have your endorsement for those. I'm happy to take any questions. Questions? Somebody must have a question. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Councilor Thomas. A question and a comment. Uh, I think one of the first things that uh, I learned about when I was elected to council was the importance of procurement, something that I knew nothing about, as it turns out, prior to that, because it was not one of those things that I, that I lay awake and thought about. I apologize for that. Okay. Um, but 
often we hear in the community, and, and this is excellent work, and I'm glad to see you moving forward and sort of modernizing and keeping everything up to date, because one of the things that uh, we hear most in the community as politicians is, uh, you know, perhaps, uh, well, I won't say, crit well, okay, we get criticized quite often for, uh, for the city's procurement policies because we're not favoring local businesses, and this was one of the very first questions I had when I got elected. Could you just tell us a little bit about why we cannot favor specifically local businesses when it comes to purchasing and procuring things for the city? Through you, Mayor Buddy. So, absolutely. So, local preference is a hot topic. I think it comes before every council, every term. Um, I've been asked the question, I've been in procurement 25 years. I started when I was 12, for the record. Um, and I have been asked that question numerous times. So there is, um, within legislation, there's the Ontario Business Discriminatory Act. Within that, it bans us from applying local preference to any vendor. We can build in requirements if they're merited, such as a response time. So think of if we were hiring, we didn't have the, our fire services, and we were hiring a company to provide a similar type service, and they had to respond within a certain time, we can build those types of requirements in. We can't mandate that they have a local preference, or a local office, if that helps. Could I just follow up? I'd just like to ask, so, Supposing uh, we, in our wisdom, decided we weren't going to follow those procurement uh, practices and we were going to go ahead and we were going to favor a local business, what, what would uh, the upshot be for us? What could potentially happen to the city as a result? So through you, Mr. Mayor, so um, without giving legal advice, but you would be opening yourself up to legal challenge, basically, from another proponent who could, um, another bidder, who could say, that's not fair, you're not allowed to do that, and we could be challenged on that award. I think there is uh, precedent has been set, as I recall, in uh, the Hamilton area if uh, something like this happened. Uh, lots of precedent has been set. We would not be very successful in that. Okay. Thank you for the information. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Councilor Merton. Through your worship, under your financial and budget implications, um, you're discussing a change from a city pay model to a vendor pay model. Can you, can you fill us in a little bit more how you would introduce that because that's a change in practice. I mean, it's not just operationally or a work plan. It's a change in practice. Yes. And then does that link to the annual savings component or is there something in addition? If you could just elaborate on that, please, because it is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, the city pay model, uh, um, in layman's term, is sort of an, an old school model where um, public agencies would purchase the software that they would utilize to post bid solicitation. It was sort of what was started back when these sort of software systems first became available. Over time, those software systems transitioned to a vendor pay model. Um, so what it means is, with the city pay model, we pay a license fee so much per year to have access to these modules, such as the contract management, being able to post our bids, um, being able to receive electronic bids. The vendor pay model, they pay us basically a subscription fee. So with the module we use, it's $169 for a year. Um, or if they don't want to subscribe to a year, they can pay for a one, like a per bid fee. I believe it's approximately $45. The key is, and this is an important one, is that vendors are already paying that subscription fee. So bids and tenders is a system that we utilize. It is utilized extensively, not only across Ontario, but across Canada. And I would say a high percentage of our vendors are already utilizing that model. They already pay a subscription fee. So they would have access to ours. They wouldn't, it wouldn't change anything for them. Um, so that's sort of that, and that's where we would see the savings. If we don't implement that vendor pay model and we stick with sort of the old school where we buy a licensing fee for it, then in order to do electronic bid submissions, we'd have to buy another module, pay additional licensing fees. Thank you. Okay. Great. Just a couple of follow up questions. Um, first, to follow up on Councillor Thomas' inquiry on the um, local preference. If, for example, you had a bid A at $50,000, bid B comes in at $67,000, difference 17000 
Uh, is there also case law out there where a uh, municipality would say we're going to go with bid B um, and we will cut the difference of a $17,000 check to company A, if you follow me on that. Because they did have low bid, but you're going with company B, they're local, and you write the check for the difference. So three, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd have to research. I'm not aware of case law where someone has done that. The issue is, there's a couple issues that arise from that. One, it depends whether you're in a tender situation or a proposal situation. So in a tender, you, I can't imagine anyone being successful that, with that approach. I'd re, I'll research it, but I can't imagine that. And there's, there's a couple reasons for that. In a tender situation, we have contract A, contract B. It was started from the case law back in 1981, a case called Ron Engineering. So what happens is when we put out that offer, so, so you know, when we put out the request to tender, it's saying we want this work completed. If they submit a compliant bid, we're in contract A with them. So we're in contract A with every vendor who has submitted a compliant tender. So we have a duty to those vendors. So we have a duty to award to the lowest compliant tender. We can't say we don't want to because you're not local okay. and get away with that. Okay. Could your worship in that case, you'd also have spent an extra $34,000 because you'd be paying a 67 to a successful bidder plus 17 to the other. I don't see where any taxpayer would think you were doing a very good job for long if they did that. Whether it was legal or not, it's a terrible business. Yes. Yeah. Do you, Mr. Mayor, you would also have extensive legal fees. Yeah. Um, second question, when you're when you're meeting with uh, counterparts, is there any consideration, I mean, we're, the world's changing, we're, we're looking to engage more green initiatives, is there any discussion about in, uh, initializing like a carbon cost? So, I mean, if you award a contract to a company that's 350 kilometers away, uh, there's a more significant cost to that company uh, or it being incurred to the environment for them to travel than there is a local. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, from what I'm aware of, I haven't heard that specifically related to carbon. One of the innovative practices that you're going to start to hear a lot of is called social procurement, um, if you haven't already heard. And there's some really great examples out there of how they have built into their, um, it's harder to do in a tender situation, but in a request for proposal situation, specifically a non-binding, I'm getting a little technical, sorry. Um, where you, you open yourselves up a little bit to risk, but you have a little bit more option in terms of negotiating with your vendors. You can incorporate requirement related to social procurement. Often what they'll try and do is say, uh, there's a great example from the Olympics from out west, further flower supplier. So the Olympics went out to hire their supplier who was going to do all the flowers for the Olympics. As part of the proposal, they had to include a social procurement criteria. So the winning proponent proposed, not only will, here's my price to do the flowers, I will train women who are socially disadvantaged, I will um, apprentice them to become florists. Um, and then there's amazing, like stunning results from that, like 80% of those women went on to stay in the florist industry and worked afterwards. So, there's a lot of those types of things. I haven't heard it specifically related to the carbon side of it, um, but we are seeing more and more in, in sort of that innovative approaches of how can we build in other requirements than just the straight, this is the good we want, Okay. if that helps. And then, uh, if I could, just one other follow-up on Councillor Merton. I had a little bit of concern on, on the pay-per-use subscription as well. Um, and it's just, could that potentially you know, kind of eliminate some small local bidders who, if they're not successful for a number of times, just decide that they're not going to to subscribe and take part in, in the process anymore. And we're just kind of done narrowing ourselves to bigger companies. You're going to pay for it anyway because they just add that cost into their contract or into their bid. Um, but you're, you're kind of eliminating the small fish from the, the pond, if you follow me there. Like, any, is there any discussion on that? That's my only concern here. I don't want to do that, obviously. No, absolutely. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would say uh, back about 10 years ago when they really organizations really started to shift to the vendor pay model, there was definitely that concern. And people talked about it. 
frequently. Um, but what they actually saw in practice was not that. Because you, um, if you're a vendor that signs up to have a subscription, you can self-identify what commodities you're interested, what towns you're interested. So, and it saves that person, that organization, from having a staff member how to go out and actively search for where are the bid opportunities posted. So we'll often see small businesses, they can sign up for Georgian Blast, they can sign up for Municipality of Meaford, Town of Blue Mountains, who all utilize that same system. Um, and we haven't seen the drop off of small organizations. Thank you. Councillor Hamley? I'll move the, the, uh, the recommendation. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor? That is carried. Thank you very much for uh, the information and, uh, for, and the report. Uh, 12F, verbal report from Deputy Mayor Larry and Gray County Council. Nothing to report. Okay. Let me uh, thank Councillor Thomas for attending my behalf while I was uh, out escaping. Consent agenda at 13. Thank you, Your Worship. On the consent agenda this evening is a report respecting lease renewals with Transport Canada for certain lands within the harbour. A report respecting the Fall Classic Slow Pitch Tournament at Duncan McClellan Park and a flag flying request from Big Brothers Big Sisters of Grey Bruce. There are minutes for receipt from the Festival of Northern Lights, Grey Solo Conservation Authority, DIA Board and Library Board. Business licenses were issued to Goodfellows Family Martial Arts at 1063 Third Ave East. Miss Fixit, who relocated to 1077 Second Ave East Suite C. T2 Green obtained a Hawker and Peddler license and SO gas station at 1510 9th Avenue East. Lastly, there is correspondence presented for the information of council. A full listing is available at 13K. Thank you. Moved by myself that City Council receive items 13A to 13K on the consent agenda dated August 12, 2019, and further that the recommendations contained in reports 13A and 13B be approved. Thank you. All in favor? That is carried. I don't know if I can go through that. I see at uh, 13F there's uh, Conservation Authority. Councillor Kepke or Councillor Drake? I can present, but there's nothing that's uh, too relevant to the city. If somebody has any questions, I, I invite them. But Okay. I'm not seeing anyone ask questions. Um, What's next, DAA May 8th and June 12th? Thank you, Worship. Uh, Jackie Fertner attended the Ontario Business Improvement Area Association Conference on behalf of the DIA Board. She highlighted information relevant to the Own Sound DIA, including relationship building, funding agreements, accessibility, and pathway to purchase initiatives. Dave Edwards, representing St. Andrew's Church, asked questions about the downtown free parking decision as it was not satisfying to his clients. City Manager Wayne Ritchie discussed signage, messaging, uh, merchants being able to hand out parking passes, and lot four turnover concerns. It was decided the daily parking pass be implemented for long-term parking areas for $5 a day. The DIA board agreed to create a survey for downtown merchants respecting the use of their washrooms by the public. Uh, there was a verbal report from the IT manager regarding the DIA website redesign. And there was a verbal report from Peter Reed asking for improvement on communication between the board and its membership, including newsletters, the reestablishment of block captains, and checking in with the needs of the membership. And for the minutes of from June 12th, the DIA board approved a $2,000 donation to the Citizens on Patrol. The manager of community development and marketing provided a presentation regarding the Downtown River Precinct project marketing and promotion during the construction. He provided the goals, communication plan, and marketing promotion, including social media, improved signage, website improvements, and regular updates on the construction progress. Brent Fisher also provided an overview report on the DIA spring celebration, including attendance statistics and financial details. Uh, the DIA voted to dissolve the marketing promotion and streetscape committee and deal with those directly during board meetings. The Director of Public Works and Engineering provided a ver verbal report on the proposed detours affecting the downtown core during the 10th Street Bridge construction, as well as changes made to the loading zones in the downtown core. Thank you, Worship. Any questions for Deputy Mayor Larry? 
seeing none, if I can uh, skip back, I skipped too quickly. 13 D and E are uh, minutes from Festival of Northern Lights. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, Pretty much business as usual in the first set of minutes from April 30th. Uh, the festival is always looking for volunteers, people who like to paint and hammer and saw and bend wires. So uh, if anyone would like to volunteer for any of those jobs, they can contact myself or the, uh, through the festival website. Uh, the second set of minutes uh, was an emergency meeting held on May 14th while I was unfortunately out of province on vacation, so I wasn't at the meeting. Uh, but it primarily dealt with the uh, resignation of the festival administrator who uh, has taken a position with the city uh, uh, on that leave uh, in our uh, special events department. Uh, so I do know that uh, the festival is presently putting together a job description for that position and uh, will be advertising uh, sometime in the near future. Thank you. Questions? Go ahead. I had one question. Um, when they do... Um, special events like the trivia, do they provide financial details because there's nothing in the map? Uh, they do to the board uh, later on. At this point, uh, trivia night hadn't yet happened when these minutes went through. Right. So it has happened in the meantime. So we will get a report on the, uh, the total that was raised and the expenses and all those sort of things. Great. Thank you. Councilor yeah. Greg. Thanks, everybody. Uh, just a question for Councillor Thomas, but also I, before that, I have a question on the 19-110 lease renewals, if I may ask the question um, for Councillor Thomas. But I wonder, a few years ago, the the festival moved to the Saturday night, and it was announced, uh, I think, probably in March of that year. I was sitting right there. I was on the committee at the time, and it was in the winter guide, and I showed the ad. And it's been on the Saturday night, and I think quite successfully. In the one set of minutes, it said the city had asked for them to consider going back to the Friday night, and I went back through DIA minutes thinking maybe I missed something. Um, I wasn't sure where this that request came from. I, you, I think it may have been more of an informal discussion between, uh, between Brent Fisher and uh, the chair of the festival, just sort of feeling out whether the festival might consider a move back to the Friday nights. Uh, I'm not sure it was an official letter or anything like that. Okay. Uh, could I ask, I'm just in the lease, you know? What's that? It's the first report in the consent first agenda. Four. Okay, transport canvas or lands to the harbor. Okay, go ahead. I'm just wondering, it, it seems each time these come forward, it's just a 3%, 3%, 3%, and they're fairly small amounts, but uh, the last assessment cycle, I think pretty much the city of Owen Sound came in pretty much flat at zero. Do we go back and say, uh, how about we re-sign the lease at 1%, or do we just keep re-signing these and, and we're just paying them what they're asking? Like, let's, I think I don't think we should be doing three percent every year for each renewal. Through your worship, um, there's certainly not a negotiation with Transport Canada. If it's Council's wish that we not sign the lease agreements at this time and ask them about the increase in the rate, I'm certainly um, happy to, to implement Council's direction. Back to uh, Councillor Thomas, I think. Yes, with regard to the uh, library. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, these are the minutes of the May 30th board meeting. So uh, many of the things reported in the minutes have already happened uh, over the summer. Um, not much to report. We think we finally got a handle on the uh, ongoing problems we've had with the HVAC and the roof repair. We've had a couple of leaks that we've been trying to track down and. Uh, I believe there is some certain degree of optimism at the library now that we have solved that problem. Uh, so uh, that, and of course, we did uh, talk extensively about the SOLVES budget cuts, but I'll just bet my bottom dollar you guys don't want to hear about the interlibrary loan service again. So I'll just continue on past that one. Um, a number, lots of activities in the library. I mean, the place is busier than it's ever been. Uh, we did get confirmation that we'll be having uh, 
Author Isaac Murdoch is a part of the Festival of Authors. Owen Sound has become a favorite stop for the festival uh, every fall. And uh, that's pretty much it. Questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Um, thanks for everyone that's just uh, reported on, on those uh, arm's length committees. Down to number 14. Um, 14A is Minutes from Accessibility Advisory Committee. Councilor Merton. To your worship. So I'd like to discuss the accomplishments in the, that we as an Accessibility Advisory Committee achieved in the meeting of July 29th. In this meeting, we reviewed the last two pillars, the transportation and design of public spaces of the multi-year accessibility plan that was presented by city staff. The specific items that were discussed included ensuring accessible equipment is functional on city buses, the need for public input regarding accessible taxi cabs and working together with the Owen Sound Police Services and Board who are the lead regarding accessible taxi cabs and accessibility relating to trails and exterior paths of travel. The actions requested of city staff by the committee included information on performance monitoring specifically related to mobility transit, information on how the city can solicit feedback on the transit contract, information on how other municipalities conduct performance monitoring and feedback from transit riders, review of the designated accessible parking spots in relation to ease of access to sidewalks and curbs, review of cost and the option of free transit for people declared legally blind or have low vision based on other municipality practices. The committee reviewed the site plan for the API hotel and recommendations were provided. Finally, we're going to ask Ethan Robert to assist you may recall that we had put into place a 1511 extension that talked about road closures. And thanks to Sean, um, we've been able now to have a 1411 that people can access for bus route information as we go through our, our renovations. So if, if we can just take a few minutes, and Ethan, do you mind saying what number they call in, and then the 1411 will listen to it, please. Thank you. Information hotline. Bus route changes. As part of a fourth Q water main upgrade project, please be advised that the core transit routes will be affected. Core detour will begin at 10th Street East and 3rd Avenue East and rerouted as follows. South on 3rd Avenue East to 9th Street East. West on 9th Street East to 3rd Avenue West. North on 3rd Avenue West to 10th. Sorry, the number they can reach uh, to get that to be, get to the extension 1411 is 519-376-1440. Thank you. So based on that information, the minutes that were provided, I would request a motion for approval for the uh, Accessibility Advisory Committee minutes. Any questions? Seeing none, I, I, I've got one that you've just triggered. This is not actually for you. You mentioned accessible taxis. Um, we had a discussion at the police board some months ago. There had been a report that was provided and uh, we asked for them to come back and contact the city again with regard to some creative things and how we could get accessible taxis. Have you heard anything back, Ms. Coulter? Through your worship, Ms. Looney indicated that she had been requested by the, by the board to prepare that report. Um, the committee had asked that she bring a copy of that report through to the Accessibility Advisory but is Committee. Is that the first one or is that the, the, to come back I to look at? that would be the second one that she's working on. Okay. We'll have to re remember to uh, raise that and find out what's going on from that side too. Thank you very much. All in favor of uh, receipt of that or approval of that report, that is carried. Thank you. 12B, Deputy Mayor O'Leary. Uh, community services. Thank you, Worship. The committee approved the housekeeping zoning bylaw amendment for food and beverage processing facilities. Uh, there were two. 
Sorry, there were two facade improvement program applications approved, the first being at 275 8 Street East for a double facade grant. The proposal on the front facade is to replace the two second story windows and restore the broken brick and repoint. The proposal on the west side facade is to replace one new window. The second application is located at 994 2nd Avenue East, known as the Curry House. The proposal on the front facade is to remove the existing banner style fascia sign above the first story window and install a new fascia sign illuminated with two gooseneck lights above the main entrance. The junior planner presented a report on the Heritage Property Tax Relief Program regarding the 2018 tax refund application. There were 13 properties that made applications to the program in 2018. Of the 13 properties, 12 were complete and met all the eligibility criteria to receive a heritage tax rebate of 20% of the municipal and educational portions of the property taxes. The city portion for rebates in 2018 totaled $13,904, which is under the $15,000 budget. The manager of community development marketing advised that the city, that city staff met with RAMP to discuss the city goals for the winter guide. RAMP is a cultural website and social media platform for Graber Simcoe. Brent Fisher went, off, went over the proposal, including the $6,000 price, and advised that after the, reviewing the success of the winter guide, the city might also use RAMP to produce the summer guide. And finally, uh, Councillor Merton asked staff to bring back a report investigating the potential for the heritage designation for Greenwood Cemetery. And with that, Your Worship, we'll move approval of those. I apologize, Your Worship. Just one clarification. Deputy Mayor O'Leary mentioned that it was approving a uh, zoning amendment. Um, although I'm sure the province would appreciate the removal of red tape, um, we're just initiating that process and there would be uh, further technical reports and public meetings coming forward. I didn't want to think we were jumping the gun. Not a final decision, just That's a starting I decision. I stand corrected. Uh, Councillor Tammy. Very briefly, uh, to anyone who think the city is, uh, is a little stagnant from time to time, they've got to read the Ramped magazine. It is full of energy. It pulsates with optimism. It is edgy. It's a great, great addition to the local cultural scene. If you haven't read it, read it. And I don't have an interest in it. <laughs> that was my next question. So uh, all in favor of approval of the community service minutes? So that's carried. Uh, 14C, Minutes of Corporate Services, Councillor Dodd. Thank you, Worship. Uh, we have received a report regarding a residential tax sale. We received a second report, which was a housekeeping report, which amended the tax policy bylaw to correspond with the recently approved tax rates. Our third report was from Human Resources regarding our 2018 selection, recruitment, and turnover. Overall, in the 2018 year, we had 103 positions filled. This includes full-time, part-time, seasonal, contract, and student hires. And out of that 103, 80 of them were new hires that weren't including returning employees. That doesn't include library or police. 89 employees turned over or left the corporation in 2018. If we looked at all of those um, um, employment sectors, full-time, part-time, seasonal, contract, and student, our turnover rate was 44%. However, if we excluded seasonal, contract, and student, our turnover rate was 8. National average is 16. Mm -hmm. um, 2019 bylaw enforcement update was our fourth report for quarter two. We received 378 total calls. 232 were investigated, 125 were general inquiries. Of those in investigated, 100 were due to yard maintenance and property standards, and 33 were waste management. With that, I would move approval of those minutes of worship. Good. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. Uh, so that gets us through the reports. So we're down to number 16, motions for which previously notice was given, and we have none. Discussion of additional uh, business, Councilor Merton. Through your worship, I wanted to provide the details now that they've been firmed up regarding the Community Foundation Grey Bruce 25th Anniversary Celebration Dinner. It will be held October the 5th, 5 to 9 at Stone Tree Golf and Fitness Club, and that's Highway 6 and 10, uh, just on the outskirts of Owen Sound. 
They are the ticket cost, $125, $35 of which will be refunded as a tax receipt, as a donation. And the funds for that will go to the next 25 funds that they're working on. So just wanted to provide those finalized details. Thank you. Councillor Craig. Thanks, everybody. Last uh, Thursday, uh, I was able to attend the grand opening of the CMHA as the Mental Health Services uh, Office, the CMHA Food Forest. And uh, they, with alongside many community partners who are operating the food uh, forest at the St. George's Ballpark uh, or St. George's Park, in behind St. George's Church, opened the new labyrinth. It's a left, uh, left entrance or left handed la labyrinth. Uh, there's 24 varietals of plants within it. It was uh, quite a nice morning. We had some rain before, we had some rain after. That's uh, water is life. That's what you need to uh, make the garden grow. And uh, uh, it's uh, just a nice thing for uh, council and the community to check out, uh, just uh, to uh, venture through there and see what they've done uh, with kind of an old uh, derelict uh, part of the city that's downtown. So congratulations to them. Thanks uh, for attending that. Uh, it's really peaceful back in there, isn't it? And that's right downtown. There's also another labyrinth in the behind Georgian's Shores, which is kind of neat, too, within a block of each other. Um, Deputy Mayor O'Leary. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I have three items here. Uh, on August 2nd, I attended the Festive First Friday in downtown Owen Sound at the Antique Car Show. And uh, happy to report that there is the uh, largest number ever of cars, 154. It's a beautiful night. Um, lots of people, hundreds of people actually, and, and uh, it was a real good night. I look forward to our staff's report on what we can do better for next year. And, and I'm sure with the uh, Downtown River Precinct finished that we could maybe have entertainment or something to, to add to that uh, night. It's, uh, it was well attended. I also went to the Grievous Kennel Obedience Club Dog Show at Harrison Park. Uh, I love to go down there and, and watch. The, it's, it's amazing. I was, I was pleasantly surprised at the number of people that go to these. And, you know, the campgrounds are completely full. There's lots of people around. Um, and uh, I just want to mention I was there on late Saturday afternoon, too, and uh, with my grandkids. The most people I've ever seen at Harrison Park. And, you know, when I, when I talk about putting money into our facilities, that's why. They, they, they just come by the thousands, and, uh, and our park is, is certainly number one. Uh, and the third item, I spoke at the, uh, brought greetings at the opening ceremonies of the Under-19 Canadian Fastball Championships. And uh, it was interesting to get some of the comments. I, I talked with Fred Wallace, and he said there was a lot of uh, comments made about the upgrades to the washrooms and the water filling stations and, uh, and how nice our ballpark looked. And uh, again, it was only like two meetings ago that we decided to put money into the bleachers that would, uh, which will be done this fall, I believe. And uh, the crowd at the opening ceremonies was, uh, was pretty big. And when I look at the teams that came to Owen Sound, uh, these teams all arrived on the Sunday and they left on the following Sunday, so they were here uh, more than a full week. We had teams from Newfoundland, Quebec, New Brunswick, British Columbia, Saskatoon, Nova Scotia, and there's another team from Saskatchewan, and the rest of the team. I think there's 14 teams all together. Um, I know that there was a couple of teams that had to camp at Harrison Park because they couldn't get hotel rooms. That's the economic spin-off that I'm talking about when we're putting money into facilities. The great ballpark, I talked to Sandy and Bill Simpson this afternoon, who uh, ran the tournament, they said the comments they were getting back was, it's the best tournament put on in Canada ever. That's how happy they were with it. So, you know, just with uh, teams, uh, umpires, families, just the teams themselves, they bring in over 500 people to Owen Sound for over a week, and then all of the people that came to watch, it's uh, fantastic. Um, that's why we put money into our ballpark. That's all. Thank you. Um, I attended uh, the, as several other counselors did, the uh, uh, Emancipation History Picnic Festival. It's the 157th longest running, continuously running uh, emancipation uh, uh, event in North America. Um, 
Attended for the second year in a row was uh, Senator Wanda Thomas Bernard, who is a appointed to the Senate of Canada, Nova Scotia. Uh, she was a social worker and then um, from East Preston, Nova Scotia, and then became a professor at Dalhousie. She'd never heard of it two years ago or three years ago and came mm -hmm. last year and o was overwhelmed and came again. I talked to another man, and I've, I've forgotten his name, who was uh, doing research in his PhD and was filming it to be able to do a documentary for uh, South Africa. South Africa is just still, you know, 20 years out of uh, apartheid, learning how to do things that we take for, uh, for granted. It's uh, so cool to see generation after generation come back year after year to pay uh, tribute to their ancestors and to the people that uh, went before and uh, the impact in our community um, from the uh, from their ancestors, and people that have come up the uh, Underground Railway uh, and former slaves, etc. It was great that they uh, honored uh, Councillor Lemon for his um, um, getting the uh, the cairn built there and uh, his, his foresight and how much work he put into it uh, over a number of years, and also to Town Prior, Bruce Cruder, thank you, OPP officer, grew up in Owen Sound. Um, he knew one of the great grandchildren of the uh, original Town Prior of Owen Sound uh, and, and has continued to come back year after year since 2001 to be the Town Prior. And it was a uh, Great to see him there, even though with all that clothing and uniform on, it was a pretty hot way standing there. And uh, just a special guy in a special event. Um, this is pretty special. You know, it's it's gone from just being a picnic. Uh, Friday night, the uh, speakers out at uh, Grey Roots, um, you know, discuss history, discuss different things, and it's. Uh, great opportunity for anyone that can be there to go and, uh, and, and learn about some of our history that maybe isn't written in a textbook and uh, we don't get enough of and we don't recognize enough. Um, going forward, I'm suggesting uh, that we're going to have to try and do a little bit more to, to recognize that event and see how we can uh, maybe do some creative things uh, with and, and for them. So it was great to attend it uh, again this year. Though my holidays always start on that Friday, I always try and make sure that I'm there on the Friday night and the uh, Saturday and, and then leave after that to, uh, to be able to attend it. Anyway, congratulations to the people that did organize it and everyone that, uh, that came to it. Um, number 18. Moved by myself that the Committee of the Whole rise and report. All in favor? That is carried. Uh, back into the formal proceeding, proceedings, motion to adopt the proceedings. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Hamley, that the action taken in Committee of the Whole in considering public meetings, deputations and presentations, public question period, matters arising from correspondence, reports of city staff, consent agenda, committee minutes, matters postponed, motions for which notice was previously given, and additional business be confirmed by this council. All in favor? That is carried. Notices of motion. New notices seeing none. Bylaws. Go ahead. To your worship, the bylaws listed for approval on tonight's agenda include the confirmatory bylaw, a bylaw to execute a second amending site plan agreement with McCashfeld Industries for property at 2050 20th Street East, a bylaw to authorize the levying of a tax upon certain institutions, bylaw respecting retail business holiday closures, a bylaw to execute a site plan agreement at 884 10th Street West, and a bylaw to execute a servicing agreement at 884 10th Street West, a bylaw to adopt an official plan amendment respecting the Ann Pett subdivision located west of 16th Avenue East and north of 10th Street East, a bylaw to amend the zoning bylaw respecting the Ann Pett subdivision, a bylaw to execute an agreement respecting a second extension of time for payment of development charges, a bylaw to execute an agreement with EQ with EC King Contracting respecting asphalt resurfacing, a bylaw to execute an encroachment agreement with Sydenham Properties respecting 89th Street East, a bylaw to execute a condominium certificate of exemption for the Sydenham located at 89th Street East, a bylaw to execute a site plan agreement for 1857 23rd Street East for an auto repair shop, and a bylaw to adopt the strategic asset management policy. Okay, thank you. 
Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Hamley, that bylaw numbers 2019, 129, 130, 131, 132, 133, 134, 135, 136, 137, 138, 139, 140, 141, 142, and 143 be passed and enacted. That is carried. Just before we adjourn, if you guys will let me throw in one more additional business. Of course, it's Summer Folk Weekend. I can't believe I didn't cover that. It's uh, a, like most summer folks, it's uh, sometimes you don't know who's going to come, but if you go to summerfolk.org and look at the performers, there's uh, YouTube uh, of all of them, and there's some really outstanding performers coming again this year. So congratulations to the uh, artistic director for another year of great finds, and it uh, should be a great weekend. So with that, uh, we've concluded our business. It's 9.15, and we're adjourned. Thanks, everybody.